Ich möchte aber hier den Staatsmännern in Paris und London versichern, dass es auch deutsche Interessen gibt, die wir entschlossen sind wahrzunehmen, und zwar unter allen Umständen. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My fellow Americans, I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. General Eisenhower tonight issued a blunt communique which says that Allied forces have succeeded in their initial landings in France. We are warned that the first enemy counterattacks may be expected within 48 hours. The drop was at night. They were just getting, uh, like, jumping out in the closet and, and they had no idea what they were going to encounter when they got on the ground. The Americans fought so hard, the poor soldiers. So many of them were killed or wounded. We knew that they were not just fighting for themselves, they were fighting for us too. A French village with its ancient church. A picturesque, gently flowing river. An isolated rural bridge. A seldom traveled country lane. And the farmhouse wall destined to become a place of honor. Local landmarks in Normandy, France, of little concern to the outside world until June 6, 1944, and what would forever be known as D-Day, when each location became a critically coveted American battlefield objective, bought with blood and bravery by the 82nd Airborne. They were the point of the spear, 17,000 Allied paratroopers and glider troops in three divisions, one British, two American, who would lead the way for a mighty Allied invasion force that would be unleashed against Adolf Hitler's infamous Atlantic Wall and launch a powerful offensive designed to liberate German-occupied France and ultimately to defeat Nazi Germany and end World War II in Europe with an Allied victory. It was known as Operation Overlord, the largest amphibious military operation in history. 150,000 troops, 5,000 ships, 10,000 aircraft, all hurled at Normandy on the coast of France. And first in were the airborne troops. The invasion force was slated to land on five carefully selected beach landing sites, codenamed Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. British troops were charged with taking Gold and Sword. Canadian forces had to take Juno. And the Americans were assigned the task of capturing the two beaches on the invasion's right flank, Omaha and Utah. The airborne operation would protect the landing force on the beaches from German counterattacks and would capture and hold crossroads, bridges, and roadways necessary for the main force to advance off the beaches and move inland. The two American airborne divisions chosen for D-Day's airborne assault were the 101st Airborne, the Screaming Eagles, and the 82nd Airborne, known as the All-American Division. Together, they would secure the invasion force's western flank, while the British airborne troops secured its eastern flank. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the supreme commander of Allied forces, considered the airborne assault to be the most difficult and dangerous operation of D-Day. His great fear 
was that the drop behind enemy lines might place the courageous paratroopers in a slaughterhouse that few would survive. It could be a death drop, but it was decided the success of the D-Day landings depended on striking the first blow behind German lines before the beach landings, and airborne troops would be the best to do it. You need to secure certain things, and the, the airborne are the best ones. There's, a, there's an element of surprise, causes chaos. The two divisions of American airborne troops were drawn from the cream of American youth. Volunteers, all of them, and young. Most of them were still in their 20s, officers included, and many of them were 18 or 19 years old or even younger. The paratroopers themselves, some of them, uh, like the jump masters and so on, probably were seasoned, more seasoned paratroopers. They had done it before. Some of the newer had never jumped in combat before. They had, certainly had a lot of training jumps. Robert Hirsch was a lieutenant in the U.S. Army Air Force in the war's European theater of operations. He was a pilot flying the C-47 Dakota transport aircraft that carried American airborne troops into combat, and he viewed the young paratroopers with respect. I've often thought that I'd, uh, I'd I hate to be facing one of those guys on the ground. More than 900 C-47s were assembled to ferry the American airborne troops to Normandy. They took off from airfields in Britain on the evening of June the 5th, 1944, so the paratroopers could begin jumping just after midnight on D-Day. Once the paratroopers were aboard the C-47s and in the air, there was no turning back. The pilots were given two extra instructions before they took off with their, with their flight plans. One of them was bring no paratroopers back, and the threat was court martial. The other one was do not avoid flak, anti-aircraft fire. Very easy to say. Aboard their aircraft, the paratroopers checked and rechecked their weapons and gear, which for some soldiers almost doubled their body weight. You know, they were all painted up <laughs> and everything for camouflage and what have you. And uh, they were, their mission was to kill. Uh, and they had a mindset that was uh, something that was hard to describe. The American Airborne Assault Force was ferried over the English Channel and then approached its drop zones on Normandy's Cotentin Peninsula from the west. Parachuting in ahead of the main force was a group of specially trained paratroopers called the Pathfinders. Their task, once on the ground, was to set up signaling devices so the troops of the two airborne divisions could locate the drop zones and jump in the right places. The troops of the 101st Airborne began jumping just before 1 a.m. Their jump was difficult and dangerous, but once on the ground, the Screaming Eagles were able to effectively organize themselves and seize their objectives despite heavy fighting and serious casualties. The British airborne troops also encountered heavy resistance, but managed to capture and hold their main objectives, including the critically important Orn River Bridge near Caen. The troops of the 82nd Airborne, however, encountered potentially disastrous challenges from the beginning, but they were up to the challenge. At the time of D-Day, the 82nd Airborne was America's first-born and most experienced airborne division. Created as an infantry division in World War I, the 82nd was one of the first American units to fight in France, distinguishing itself in the campaigns that ended the First World War in an Allied victory. Because its soldiers were drawn from every American state, it was nicknamed the All-American Division. Reactivated during World War II, just three months after the surprise Japanese attack on American forces at Pearl Harbor, the 82nd Airborne Division was reorganized as the U.S. Army's first specialized airborne unit and gained valuable combat experience 
with airborne operations in Sicily and Italy. At 1.51 a.m. on D-Day, paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne began jumping into the dark skies of Normandy. The division was commanded by Major General Matthew Ridgway and his second-in-command, Brigadier General James Gavin, both of whom jumped into Normandy with their troops. The 82nd's paratrooper assault force consisted of three parachute infantry regiments, the 505, the 507, and the 508. More than 6,400 paratroopers carried into battle by 369 Dakota C-47s. They would be followed by reinforcements from the 82nd's 325th Glider Infantry Regiment. Most of the young officers piloting the C-47s were flying into battle for the first time, and many were shaken by their introduction to combat. D-Day was the first of the big paratrooper invasions, so uh, the amount of actual experience was very little uh, for that type of an operation. Confused by an unexpected heavy cloud cover, unnerved by German anti-aircraft fire, and unable to pick up the Pathfinder signals below, many of the inexperienced pilots flew too low or too high, too fast or too wild as they approached their drop zones. The reality of it is that flak doesn't shoot down every airplane. But when you're green, you believe it does. The C-47 pilots' erratic reactions to combat conditions meant that most of the 82nd Airborne paratroopers jumped at the wrong time and in the wrong place. Some landed in water, the great fear for all paratroopers, which proved fatal to at least 36 82nd Airborne paratroopers on D-Day. So when they landed in water, uh, some, they had so much weight on them, on their body, that uh, they weren't able to get to their feet uh, in the water, and some of them just uh, drowned. Others landed near German strong points and were captured or killed. Some landed atop barns or farmhouses. Many landed in trees. The drop was at night, you know, and uh, they were just getting, uh, like jumping out in the closet, you know, uh, and, and they had no idea what they were gonna encounter when they got on the ground. At one point, in a Norman apple orchard, an unarmed German medic who chose to treat a wounded and unconscious American paratrooper was surprised by cigarettes falling from the dark sky overhead and only later realized they were dropped by American paratroopers hanging in the trees above who chose to reward him rather than shoot him. One 82nd Airborne paratrooper recounted later how he landed in a giant cow pie which prompted snickers and jokes from his fellow soldiers. I should have shot that cow, he later mused. Dropped off course far from their drop zones in the darkness, most paratroopers had difficulty finding their rallying points and reaching their objectives on time, and were further hampered by Normandy's dense hedgerows, which were composed of thick foliage, vines, and trees, and were almost impossible to penetrate. The idea is we would push rapidly across the peninsula. Now we don't do that. Movement is glacially slow. Each plane load of paratroopers was called a stick in airborne jargon in what was arguably D-Day's most dramatic airborne disaster the fell two sticks of paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne. It occurred here, seven miles inland from Utah Beach at San Mer Iglis, a small but critically important crossroads town that straddled the national road leading eastward toward faraway Paris and distant Germany, and which would become the road of liberation as thousands of American troops poured ashore. If you want to move north, south, east or west, you've got to go through San Mer Iglis. The town was also an important telephone communications point for the German army in this part of Normandy, and capturing it was the chief objective of the 82nd Airborne's 
505th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Today, San Mary Glees is still an important crossroads town for the region and for countless visitors who come to Normandy to examine the historical sites of D-Day. The medieval church for which the town is named towers above a sprawling town square, just as it did in the dark opening hours of D-Day when paratroopers from the 505 began dropping in the countryside surrounding the town, and tragically, into the town itself. Genevieve Pasquet was a child living in saint mary Glise on the night of June 5, 1944, the eve of D-Day, when excited town firemen pounded on her family's door. They reported that her father's woodworking shop and a nearby barn were on fire, and so was an adjacent house. The firefighters were pounding on our door. The noise was so loud that it scared me. They were yelling that my father's woodworking shop was on fire, and so was a house that was nearby. It was a big fire. The town's residents were summoned to the town pump, still preserved outside the church today, and formed a bucket brigade to help the firemen fight the fire. The blaze lit up the early morning darkness and illuminated the town square, just as two plane loads of paratroopers from the 82nd's 505 were ordered to jump in the wrong place. German troops had also turned out for the fire, and as the Americans drifted downward onto the square, they were slaughtered by close-range German fire. I could see fires burning and Germans running around, recalled an airborne officer looking down at the square from a passing plane. It looked like all hell had broken loose. Shot dead as they landed, some paratroopers dropped lifelessly on the square. Some were left hanging dead from telephone lines and trees around the church. Two, however, somehow survived the hail of gunfire the Germans poured into the night sky and landed on the church rooftop. One of them was Private John Steele, a 31-year-old Illinois native who had recovered from an earlier jump injury to join the D-Day drop. Today in San Mary Glees, a mannequin in a U.S. Army uniform is suspended from the church tower in honor of all American D-Day paratroopers. Steele actually landed on the opposite side of the church, where he was left hanging high above ground. But basically, he's snagged. He's 90 feet in the air. There's not much he can do, really. Um, uh, you know, if he cuts his shroud lines, he'll, he'll drop. If he tries to climb up, um, he's going to rip his chute. So basically, John Steele stays where he is. Unable to get down, Private Steele played dead and hung unmoving as the deadly chaos unfolded below. The Germans, from what, I, from what I understand, believe he's dead, and therefore they don't expend fire on somebody who, 90 feet in the air, is dead and not gonna cause them any troubles. Coming down on the rear side of the church, too, was 505 Mortar Squad soldier Private Ken Russell, age 17, whose high school graduating class back home in Tennessee was receiving diplomas that same night. Russell's parachute snagged on the roof, leaving him suspended about six feet off the ground. As Russell struggled to free himself, his mentor from training, Sergeant John Ray, landed on the ground nearby and was immediately riddled with gunfire from a German soldier armed with a machine pistol. The German then turned his gun on young Russell. Russell watches um, Sergeant John Ray uh, get shot and the German apparently swings his machine pistol around towards him and Russell said I'm his next target and Sergeant Ray from the ground manages the only thing he can get to before he dies is his pistol and he fires from the ground and hits the German in the head kills him. Using his combat knife, Russell then cut himself free and sprinted to the other side of the town square, where he stumbled onto a German anti-aircraft flak gun and promptly took it out with a hand grenade. Russell was still a teenager, but he was a paratrooper and was trained to fight. They were trained 
to kill. And uh, it was kill or be killed. An hour after it began, the deadly firefight around San Mary Iglesias Church was over. The square was quiet. The Germans had withdrawn to their quarters on the edge of town, leaving the bodies of the 82nd Airborne paratroopers where they had fallen. Meanwhile, in the countryside surrounding San Mary Iglesias, the 82nd's widely scattered paratroopers moved through the darkness looking for other soldiers and searching for their rallying points so they can move on and capture their objectives. Just before dawn, 180 of them quietly slipped into San Mary Iglesias town square, where they were enraged to find their dead comrades hanging from telephone lines and trees. They were led by Lieutenant Colonel Edward Cannonball Kraus, age 27, who commanded the 3rd Battalion of the 82nd 505 Parachute Infantry Regiment and who was charged with overseeing the capture of San Mary Glees. To overwhelm the town's German garrison by surprise, Krauss ordered his paratroopers to make an assault with unloaded rifles using only fixed bayonets or combat knives. Very, very much hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Krauss's gamble worked. He and his men overwhelmed the town's German defenders, killing 10, capturing 30, and taking the town. Henri Renault was 10 years old at the time of D-Day and was the son of San Mary Glees' mayor. He would never forget the Americans who had liberated his town, but as a little boy, he did not know how to react to the horrors of war. And when the first paratroopers landing, it was easy to run there and to kill them. And uh, he had seen this, this uh, soldier in the tree who had been killed. I go a little bit far, and uh, in the other tree, his boots was maybe one meter from the soil, at the same level as my nose, my nose, and I push his boot and he swung and an uh, uh, American paratrooper who was here say, don't do that, get out. After cutting the town's telephone lines to disrupt German communications, Krauss and some of his soldiers headed here, to the town's L'Hôtel de Ville, its town hall. There, he raised an American flag that he had brought with him from Italy, where he had raised it over the city hall of Naples. Today, Krauss's flag is preserved at the 82nd Airborne Division War Memorial Museum at Fort Bragg, where it holds a place of honor in the museum's World War II section. And in faraway San Mary Glees, a second flag that flew above the town hall is displayed there as a treasured memorial. San Mary Glees had been liberated. The 82nd Airborne had captured its chief objective, but could the town be held? Both north and south of town, German forces were massing in huge numbers for a counterattack. Two miles north of San Mary Glees, a stately chateau marked the tiny rural community of Navila Plain, which lay alongside the national road that the Germans would use to attack San Mary Glees from the north. The chateau was home to Suzanne Duchning, then 22 years old, her little brother and their widowed father. In the pre-dawn darkness of D-Day, she would later recall, they heard the roar of airplanes overhead and rushed outside to see paratroopers falling from the dark sky. The noise of the airplanes woke us up. They were flying right over our house. We went outside and saw paratroopers coming down in the darkness all around us. They were landing in all directions, some landing on our grounds, and they were everywhere. The paratroopers who landed near the chateau and assembled at Navila Plain set up a fortified roadblock on the highway near the community's Catholic church. They were commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Vandervoot, a 29-year-old battle-hardened New Yorker who commanded the 2nd Battalion of the 82nd 505 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Despite breaking his ankle in the jump, 
he had quickly gotten his battalion in position to help hold San Mary Glees. Van der Voort was absolutely bang on target, one of the few on D-Day. At daybreak, Van der Voort was ordered to move his battalion down the road into San Mary Glees to join Lieutenant Colonel Krauss's troops defending the town from a German attack from the south. Left behind to man the roadblock near the Navilla Plain Chateau was a single platoon of 2nd Battalion paratroopers under Lieutenant Turner Turnbull, a 22-year-old Oklahoma orphan who had made the 82nd Airborne his family. To defend his roadblock, Turnbull had 42 paratroopers. The fighting went on for hours. German artillery shells were falling all around our house. They knocked the stones off the walls of the house and shattered all of the window panes. My father was a doctor, and he was operating on the kitchen table, on both Americans and Germans. The hurt soldiers were lying all over the floor, and there were dead bodies everywhere, in the ditches, in the field, everywhere. His platoon was outnumbered five to one, but the embattled paratroopers held off one German attack after another at Navilla Plain for more than eight hours. Finally, as they were about to be overrun, they were ordered back into San Mary Glees. Of the 42 paratroopers under Turnbull's command, only 16 had survived. Lieutenant Turnbull was among the survivors, but the next day he was killed in action. But Lieutenant Turnbull, the Oklahoma orphan, and his tiny, brave band of 82nd Airborne paratroopers had held back the German counterattack at Navilla Plain long enough for Krauss and Vandervoort to defeat another German counterattack coming against San Mary Glees from the south. Then, Krauss and Vandervoort's troops were able to turn and defeat the German counterattack from the north. It had taken a supreme effort and a lot of 82nd Airborne blood, but San Mary Glees and its vital roads were secure and waiting for the American troops coming from Utah Beach. At Utah Beach, meanwhile, the landing had been far more successful than American planners had dared to hope despite a potential disaster. Shortly after dawn, troops of the U.S. 4th and 90th Infantry Divisions had headed toward the beach aboard landing craft on schedule. But the pilot craft leading the invasion force to the beach struck sea mines and sank. The first wave of American troops hit the beach anyway, but they landed in the wrong place. Huddled beneath the sand dunes on Utah Beach, the first officers ashore had to decide what to do next. Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt Jr., the senior commander on the beach and a president's son, declared, we'll start the war from here, and kept the landing craft coming in at the accidental landing site. As it turned out, Roosevelt's decision brought the landing force in at a site where German defenses were weaker Thus, the Utah Beach landings were successful beyond expectation, and Roosevelt was later awarded the Medal of Honor. While the first troops were going ashore at Utah Beach, about 12 miles inland, another combat drama was unfolding near an imposing estate called Le Chateau de Berneville. It was the headquarters of Lieutenant General Wilhelm Folley, the 46-year-old senior commander of the German 91st Air Landing Division, perhaps the toughest troops facing the American Airborne in Normandy. Early on the morning of D-Day, Folly was in a staff car headed down a little traveled country lane near his headquarters, bound for a nearby command post and, unknowingly, for a deadly confrontation with paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne. Farther down the lane at a Norman farmhouse and flour mill, a dozen lost paratroopers had stopped to ask for directions when General Fowley's staff car suddenly came racing down the lane. And when it failed to stop, the paratroopers opened fire. Fowley's staff car, which looked similar to this one, 
was riddled with bullets. Its driver was wounded, a staff officer was killed, and the car careened into the side of the farmhouse. General Folly, meanwhile, was dead, killed instantly by the opening burst of gunfire. As the smoke cleared on the isolated country lane, the lost paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne could not know that they had taken out a senior enemy commander, a serious blow for German forces. He just disappears. He's, he's, he's lost in the chaos. It added to the confusion on the German side. Nine miles west of Utah Beach, the Murder Ray River formed a natural defensive line for the Allied landing zone. It was spanned by a bridge at the rural community of Lafayette and by another one downriver near the town of Chef de Pont, both key objectives for the 82nd Airborne. Holding the bridges and not letting the Germans blow them is, uh, is the important part of the task for the 82nd Airborne. At about 10 a.m. on D-Day, the bridge at Chef de Pont became the site of a fierce and deadly struggle between its German defenders and troops from the 82nd Airborne's 507 and 508 Parachute Infantry Regiments. At one point, the American assault commander was wounded and toppled into the river. He gets on the bridge, but the Germans fire back and he's, he's hit and he tumbled into the river. The Germans brought up artillery and pounded the Americans, who were ordered to hold at all costs. 34 paratroopers desperately held on. And then, what some would later call a miracle occurred. A single U.S. C-47 flying overhead parachuted a 60 millimeter mortar right into the American position. With it, the Americans held off the Germans until reinforcements arrived, backed by light artillery, and overwhelmed the German defenders. The bridge at Chef de Pont would never again be in enemy hands. Meanwhile, less than two miles upstream, a bigger battle was underway for possession of the bridge at Lafayette. Lafayette Bridge was a principal objective for the 82nd Airborne, the route by which troops from Utah Beach would advance westward to seal off the Continental Peninsula, and it was the route by which German forces would counterattack from the west. Lafayette Bridge was deemed so important that Allied planners designated two regiments from the 82nd to hold it, the 505 and the 507. They had a phenomenally hard time at Lafayette, mainly because most of the guys don't arrive. Um, they're misdropped all over. Those that do get there are coming in in dribs and drabs. On a hill beside the bridge, the Germans had fortified a stone manor house, and the first paratroopers at Lafayette fought a bloody battle until German troops were killed, captured, or driven away. After taking the manor house, the paratroopers assaulted Lafayette Bridge, which was defended by enemy troops on the opposite bank. The fields on the far side of the river, which were flooded annually for agriculture, had been kept that way by the Germans, so the German position could not be flanked. The Germans kept the fields flooded, there's an annual inundation, January, February, and March. It's like the Nile flood. It happens every year. Um, the Germans kept the fields flooded. Unable to flank the enemy positions, the paratroopers made a frontal assault on the bridge. Another bloody fight, but the Germans were overwhelmed. By 2.30 on the afternoon of D-Day, it appeared that the 82nd Airborne had captured Lafayette Bridge. And then, the Germans returned with superior numbers and with tanks. Uh, certainly armor where airborne is, is a very bad mix for the airborne because airborne cannot take on German armor. As the German counterattack on Lafayette Bridge unfolded, on the German side of the river near a tiny rural community called Cockney, a group of 82nd Airborne paratroopers was also in a life-and-death struggle. They were commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Thames, a 36-year-old former New York City lawyer, and their D-Day rallying point was the nearby village of Umfreville. But in this apple orchard between Umfreville and Cockney, 
Timms and his paratroopers were surrounded and forced to take a stand as the Germans attacked nearby Lafayette Bridge. Is they bring up machine guns and mortars, and they're basically getting pinned down. Here, in what today is memorialized as Timms Orchard, Timms and his paratroopers fought off one German assault after another for four days. Their stubborn stand in this orchard helped distract and deplete the German forces counterattacking at Lafayette Bridge. Also memorialized on the west side of the Murderay River today is the heroic and sacrificial action of a 22-year-old 82nd Airborne soldier, Private Charles de Glopper of the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment. The 82nd Airborne's Division Glider Troops began landing early on the morning of D-Day, with a major landing of more than 4,000 glider troops and 500 gliders through June 7th. The glider troops descended on Normandy in Waco and Horsa gliders that had no engines and were towed by C-47 aircraft and then released to silently circle and land in what glider troops called controlled crash landings. The 82nd Airborne's glider troops hit the ground running and joined the fight to hold the division's objectives. On D-Day, the first glider troops suffered mightily as their lightweight gliders skidded across the fields the Germans had kept flooded and crashed into trees or hedgerow fences. Private de Glopper and a platoon of glider infantry troops were sent wading across the Murderay River during the German attacks on Lafayette Bridge and found themselves here, huddled under a hedgerow, taking heavy fire from a larger enemy force and facing annihilation. Armed with a Browning automatic rifle, de Glopper volunteered to stay back and provide cover fire while his platoon members made their escape through an opening in one of the hedgerows. And he was changing clips from his Browning and continued firing until they killed him. Uh, when they found his body, the citation says there were several empty BAR clips around him and a lot of dead Germans. Today, a monument to de Glopper marks the spot where he made his one-man stand. He saved the lives of the men in his platoon while sacrificing his own earning the Medal of Honor for what was described as unflinching heroism. Nearby, deep in Normandy's hedgerow country, Private Joe Gondera, a 20-year-old paratrooper from California serving in the 82nd's 507 Parachute Infantry Regiment, also found himself pinned down by German machine gun fire along with a detachment of troops from his regiment. After holding off the Germans for four hours, knowing death or capture was imminent, Gandera voluntarily assaulted the German line, single-handedly knocking out three German machine gun nests until he finally fell mortally wounded, an action that eventually earned him the Medal of Honor. Equally heroic was another stand that occurred here, at the village of Grenya, and which will always be associated with the 82nd Airborne. Located almost 20 miles away and far to the south of Lafayette Bridge, Grenya was not an airborne objective or a rallying point, but 180 paratroopers wound up here, making an Alamo-like defense while the battle for Lafayette Bridge raged to the north. Most of them belonged to the 3rd Battalion of the 82nd Airborne's 507 Parachute Infantry Regiment, and they were dropped farther off course than any other body of paratroopers on D-Day. 
Grania was located only five miles from the vitally important city of Carenton, and the 507 paratroopers realized that they stood in the way of any German attempt to seize and hold Carenton. So they made a stand at Grania. They were assisted by two Catholic priests and courageous residents, young and old, who risked their lives by going into the fields to gather ammunition and equipment that had been dropped for the paratroopers. One of them was Martha Rigol, who on D-Day was a 12-year-old girl living with her family on a farm just outside Grenia. I was with my older sister Odette. Our parents told us to stay at home that they were going to help the Americans collect their weapons and ammunition. I had never seen weapons or ammunition before, but soon people were bringing in a lot of it. My family helped any way they could. My sister was 18 years old and she went out with a horse and cart and helped bring in ammunition. As expected, the Germans did come. The 17th SS Panzer Grenadier Division the infamous Nazi Schutzstaffel, or Waffen-SS. Day after day until June 10th, four days after D-Day, the paratroopers at Grania drove back every German assault. The Americans fought so hard, the poor soldiers. So many of them were killed or wounded. We knew that they were not just fighting for themselves, they were fighting for us too. Finally, out of ammunition, the surviving paratroopers withdrew from Grania. When they finally occupied Grania, the SS were infuriated to learn that their huge losses had been inflicted by such a small force of American paratroopers. They took out their rage on the helpless, executing the two town priests and two church housekeepers, burning the church and the town, and executing all the American wounded they captured. The SS took some of the wounded down to a small pond near the church and they killed them with their bayonets. Then they threw their bodies in the pond. As for the troops of the 17th SS Panzer Grenadier Division, they were defeated days later in the fighting at Carenton by the 101st Airborne and the U.S. 2nd Armored Division. After being delayed and weakened by 182 hard-fighting American paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne. Today, the ruins of the church at Grenia stand as a memorial to the important and heroic last stand by the paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne and the French civilians who risk everything to help them. Midway between the bridges at Lafayette and Chef de Pont lies a smattering of stone farmhouses and barns called Le Pour Filiolet. There, in an aging farmhouse in the opening hours of D-Day, 10-year-old Lucien Osley huddled on the parlor floor with his family as waves of C-47 aircraft roared overhead and dropped paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne in the fields around the Osley farmhouse. German soldiers were staying nearby, so my parents knew that there would be a lot of fighting around our house. My mother was pregnant at the time, and she said, we have to stay together, so if we die, we will all die together. For me, as a 10-year-old, hearing that we might die was very scary. Today, the countryside around Osley's home is quiet and picturesque. But on D-Day, it was located near a paratrooper rallying point called Hill 30 that was positioned between Lafayette Bridge and the bridge at Chef de Pont. The area became a scene of intense combat as fierce fighting swept back and forth over the Osley farm. A lot of people were killed here during the fighting. 23 paratroopers, 25 including the officers. They were fighting back to German counterattacks. More than 50 German soldiers were also killed within just 100 meters of her house. During the battle, Osley's younger brother suddenly became very ill. And during a lull in the fighting, Osley's father asked the American soldiers for help. Two American medics were treating the wounded nearby, and one of them came to treat the sick boy, giving him medicine that Osley thought 
might have saved his little brother's life. Soon afterwards, German troops overran the aid station the medic had set up in a nearby barn. The medic helped his wounded paratroopers to escape, but he was caught by the Germans who killed him. He was bayoneted in the back and they dragged him outside. And Lucien believes they threw in a couple of incendiary grenades, which set the whole building on fire. Ten-year-old Lucien Osley grew up and grew old on the family farm and he never forgot the American soldiers who saved his family and his country in World War II. Decades after the war, Osley began building a wall outside the family home to honor the American paratroopers. As time passed, aging airborne veterans visiting the D-Day battlefields found their way back to the Osley home, and Osley inscribed the names of every one on his memorial wall, except one the American medic who died nearby after saving Osley's little brother. Visitors to Osley's memorial wall came and went, and Osley tried to tell each one the story about the valiant American paratroopers of D-Day, but no one knew the name of his missing medic. Lucian Osley's memorial wall remained incomplete, missing the name he sought the most. Then, in 2016, British historian and D-Day tour guide Ben Trumbull, who lived nearby in Normandy, shared the story of Osley's quest for his missing medic with Susan Eisenhower, the granddaughter of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, while she was touring D-Day sites. Through Eisenhower's extensive contacts, Osley's wall came to bear a new and final name, his missing medic. Private Frank E. Mackey Jr. from Philadelphia, where he had left a wife and 18-month-old child. He was a medic in the 82nd Airborne's 508 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Today, his grave is located in the Normandy American Cemetery overlooking Omaha Beach, and his name is now inscribed in gold letters on Lucian Osley's Paratrooper Wall of Honor. He'd searched for 72 years to find that medic, and he'd given up all hope of ever finding him. And so Lucian Osley's memorial wall is finally complete, fulfilling the dream of a 10-year-old French farm boy who witnessed a war, made a friend, and never forgot him. The battle for Lafayette Bridge, meanwhile, continued throughout D-Day and the days that followed. The fighting was up close, personal, and ferocious. At one point, German forces mounted everything they had to retake the bridge, including three tanks that came down the causeway from the west, followed by a large force of infantry. They pummeled the paratroopers, who had no tanks, and it looked like critically important Lafayette Bridge might fall. They come under repeated attack, artillery, fire, mortar fire, and Germans pushing up the road from the small chapel of Cockney. Outnumbered and outgunned, the American paratroopers temporarily fell back to high ground in the rear, except for a two-man bazooka team from the 82nd Airborne's 505 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Despite the intense, deadly German fire scouring the bridge, bazooka man Marcus Heim, a young private from New York, stood up at the end of the bridge and fired a rocket into the first German tank coming up the causeway across the river. His round hit home, just as the tank was also hit by American artillery. The tank was stopped, but two more were coming, and Heim was out of ammunition. He boldly dashed across the road under merciless machine gun fire, found several rockets from a disabled bazooka, ran back across the road, stood up and fired again, and knocked out the second tank. Now German fire poured over the bridge in a torrent as the third tank continued its advance. But Heim stood up again amidst the searing fire and knocked out the third tank. The Germans, for the time being, fell back in retreat. And Hyman and his partner pull out onto the bridge proper, move forward, 
and they're firing bazookas rounds uh, repeatedly as one captain said as though they were on the practice grounds in America um, at these German tanks uh, how either of them don't get killed uh, I find quite amazing they must have been in some kind of bubble that day um, they were loosing off these bazooka rockets into these tanks and the Germans are probably 400 strong and we're talking 50 60 yards away how did Heim and his partner survive only the good Lord knows he later observed Today, the causeway leading to Lafayette Bridge is named for Private Marcus Heim of the 82nd Airborne. But the Germans came back again and in greater strength, fortifying the opposite riverbank near Cockney Chapel and the causeway from the west. Critically important Lafayette Bridge was still threatened. The 82nd Airborne's commander, General Ridgeway, knew the bridge had to be secured for the American troops advancing from Utah Beach. The battle, in his words, was hanging by a thread. And so on the morning of June the 8th, Ridgeway ordered everything at his disposal over that bridge and into the face of the stubborn German defenders on the other side. It was a massive frontal assault, like a charge from the Civil War made by troops from the 82nd Airborne's 325th Glider Infantry Regiment and an assault force from the 507 Parachute Infantry Regiment, backed up by tanks and artillery newly arrived from Utah Beach. The bridge and the causeway were left littered with dead and wounded. It was perhaps the fiercest close-up combat of D-Day, but it worked. German forces were finally broken. The 82nd Airborne successfully held Lafayette Bridge. And by the next day, the road of liberation was clear and open for the American advance from Utah Beach. And after hours of desperate fighting on D-Day, Omaha Beach was also secure, along with the British and Canadian beaches and Allied forces were pouring inland. Weeks of bloody fighting lay ahead until the Allied forces broke out of a fully conquered Normandy and launched their mighty drive toward Germany. But Hitler's notorious Atlantic Wall had been kicked open and the airborne troops had been the first to charge inside. In less than one year, Allied forces would converge on Germany Adolf Hitler would be dead, and the so-called thousand-year Nazi Third Reich would be destroyed forever, followed by Allied victory in the Pacific. Today, Lafayette Bridge and the surrounding countryside are quiet and pastoral visited mainly by World War II buffs, serious students of history, military tours, and the children of veterans. On the bluff above the bridge, where American forces were dug in, a larger-than-life statue of an 82nd Airborne paratrooper, affectionately known to airborne veterans as Iron Mike, towers over the landscape and faces westward toward the former enemy positions. Like their fellow soldiers of the 101st Airborne, the all-American troops of the 82nd Airborne Division earned unfading honor for their extraordinary accomplishments on D-Day and in the Normandy campaign. In time, the 82nd Airborne Division was recalled to Britain to rest and refit for future battles. By then, it had engaged in 33 consecutive days of bloody combat endured more than 5,200 casualties, and earned an official post-battle assessment that stated simply, every mission accomplished. I think that's an amazing uh, display of, of uh, guts and uh, determination. For those who were killed here, I will never forget. It's a huge, um 
testimony, really, to what those guys did. You know, it could have gone the other way. The All-American 82nd Airborne had done its duty.